Hello, my friends. Welcome back to Prepare for Birth. Today's episode is episode seven already. I can't believe I have seven weeks of content. And it's about non-epidural pain control methods while in labor. So let's get started. Today we're discussing non-epidural pain control methods in labor. If you want to know all about epidurals, my episode last week is entirely about epidurals. Epidurals are popular because they're very safe, they're very effective, and they're very easily accessible because anesthesiology doctors are available on labor and delivery to be able to administer them to laboring people who want them. But just because an epidural may have been all you've heard about doesn't mean it's the only option for pain control while in labor. So today we'll talk about all the other pain management strategies that are available and the advantages and drawbacks of each of them. I described the pain of labor in the last episode and what that feels like at different points in the labor process. So go back and watch that if you need to. But as a reminder, all of our bodies are unique. Pain feels different for different people. The same way we look different on the outside, our bodies are wired all differently. And whether or not you've given birth before, even if you have, you may not know exactly what to expect from the pain experience of labor. And so it's important to keep that in mind when you're thinking about all of your different options is that this may be something I'm planning on, but keeping an open mind that the plan may change if things feel different than you expected them. I really, as a doctor, I want everyone to have the very best experience for them. And so I wanna empower you with information, but I don't want you to get too held up on having a specific plan and then suddenly fe things feel different than you thought they would. I want you to just feel like there are options and you get to choose between them. You might have a plan A or plan B, but be ready to move if, things, if the decision is right at the time. A big overarching generalization too is that None of these methods of pain control, including epidurals and the ones I'll talk about now, are associated with increasing the risk of C-section, which is important to remember because we can take that consideration off the table. It won't affect chances of C-section or vaginal delivery. All right, the first type of medication we'll discuss today is called systemic medication. So basically these are medicines that are either given as a shot intramuscularly and then absorbed in the whole body or through an IV that's absorbed to the whole body. The most common medications that are given systemically for labor pain are opiate or narcotic medications. And the most common ones that we use on labor and delivery are one that has the brand name of Stadol, which is a chemical name of butorphanol or fentanyl. The pros of these types of medications are that they're easy to administer through either an IV or intramuscularly. They last for Stadol about two hours and can relieve pain for that period of time while a patient is still able to move around. We give them in the early part of labor, which I'll discuss in a second. The cons of these medications are that they are opiate narcotic medications. They do exist in amounts that are much higher in your whole bloodstream than the very, very, very tiny amount that would get into a pregnant person's bloodstream from spinal anesthesia or epidural anesthesia. And because they're in the bloodstream, they do cross the placenta. So that's why we only give those medications early in the labor process and not during the active phases of labor because when they're in the baby's bloodstream, if the baby is born with them in the bloodstream, it can affect their ability to breathe well and they may need respiratory support when they're born. So we wanna avoid that. So the drawback of these medications is that they're only given early, but often the most intense intense parts of labor pain are the ones felt later when it's not available or not recommended to be given that then. Because they're systemic in the maternal bloodstream, there's also some increased risks of side effects of like nausea and vomiting or itching for the pregnant person as well. The next type is called spinal anesthesia. So if you watch the epidural video, I did touch on spinal anesthesia. Spinals and epidurals are very similar because they're both regional anesthesia that's administered through somewhere in the back. So with an epidural, there's an indwelling catheter, so it doesn't run out and it's in a slightly different space. Spinal anesthesia is similar in that it's administered to the spine, but it's just a one-time dose of medication through a shot. There's no catheter. And the effects of the numbing medicine last about one to two hours. Spinals are very popular and typically what's administered for a known or planned C-section when someone doesn't already have anesthesia going. The pros of spinal anesthesia is that it's very quick onset. It's very effective for relieving pain. We don't want people feeling pain or discomfort in a C-section and it's very safe. Cons are that it wears out in a certain amount of time, about one to two hours. So for a laboring person who comes in at the end stages of labor, 
a spinal may be appropriate if they're, we think they'll give birth in the next hour or two, but if it's gonna take longer, the, the spinal will wear off. There's also something called a combined spinal epidural, which gives you kind of the benefits of both. It's a quick onset from the spinal, but then the catheter being present in the epidural space allows us to dose the medication for a longer time period. Sometimes a combined spinal epidural may be used if we expect a C-section is going to last a long time, more than one to two hours, that it will be complicated, or if there's a certain birth situation where immediate relief is needed, but we expect that delivery may not happen in the next one to two hours. The next option for pain control is called a pudendal block. It gets its name because it's a numbing injection in the pudendal nerve area. The way this is administered is that an examiner, like a doc your OB doctor perhaps, places a hand in the vagina to feel for the exact area, and then a needle and numbing medication like you get at the dentist is passed through the vaginal wall to inject the nerve plexus of the pudendal nerve. It has to be done on both the left side and the right side. When it's successful, there's very good numbing of the vulvar and groin area of the skin. So this can numb that really end of delivery pain or maybe the pain from an extensive vaginal repair, but it doesn't affect the pain that people feel from contractions or maybe some of the pressure in the, in the pelvic floor region. The risk of reaction or overdosing of the local pain medication is very rare and not likely, although there are big blood vessels that are near those nerves. So those could be injured, again, it's rare, or injecting those can result in a more medicine going through the bloodstream than we intended to. The pros of this approach is that it can be very quick. It can be administered within five minutes. It's a quick bedside procedure that can be done right at the last stages of labor or done for an extensive vaginal tear that needs repair repairing, and it might provide better relief than just injecting some lidocaine in the area of the repair. The cons are that the timing can sometimes be hard. The numbing medicine won't last that long, so if the baby is taking longer to come, the numbing medicine may work and then may wear off. But on the flip side, if the person is far enough in labor that the baby's head is too low, then we can't get around baby's head to get to the area where we want to inject the numbing medicine. Also, because we have a needle through the vagina near some important structures, the person has to be able to stay very still during the procedure, which sometimes in those last stages of labor, it's very hard to stay still for the procedure to even use a pudendal block. The next method is nitrous oxide. So nitrous oxide is just like the laughing gas you get at the dentist. So nitrous oxide is an inhaled medicine. It's a combination of the gas nitrous oxide and oxygen. It's typically used in a face mask. And what the person will do is when they start feeling the intense pain from contractions, they'll put the face mask on and breathe in the nitrous oxide. It doesn't take the pain away. It just makes you away from the pain, if that makes sense. You get woozy, lightheaded, and so if you inhale a lot quickly, your hand kind of drops or you stop inhaling and there's a little valve so that it stops administering it. You're kind of out of it for a second and then you come back. So it's usually used during the height of the contraction and then not used when the contraction goes away and you kind of come back but the pain is gone and then used for the next contraction, etc. It is very fast on, fast off, meaning once you breathe in, you feel that effect, you drop the mask or take it off, the effect goes away in a few seconds. It does cross the placenta, but again, because it's fast on and fast off, we don't expect it to have a major impact on the baby's respiratory system for long because it's very fast off. The pros of this method are that it allows the person to be able to move around, it is controlled by the patient, and it can be used in combination of other methods of anesthesia as well. The cons are that it doesn't it doesn't truly take away pain, it takes you away from the pain. And when we study women who have used it, some of the pain scores vary pretty widely on what people really feel while trying to use nitrous for some relief. And the biggest con of all is that because the nitrous and oxygen together have to be administered either kind of through the walls and the equipment that's already in the hospital or by a special equipment that's wheeled in, not every birthing center will have nitrous available to be used for patients. So if this is something that you're considering using for your birth, definitely talk to your OB provider during your pregnancy about it so that they can tell you whether or not it's available there. Another option is what's called general anesthesia. So general anesthesia is a combination of inhaled and IV medicines that put a person totally to sleep. So it's just like you would get if you were having a hernia surgery or an umbilical surgery or a hysterectomy. General anesthesia, I'm glad that we have it, but it's really our method of last resort. And this is because it's not ideal for a few reasons, but it is helpful that we do have it. So if there is an absolute emergency, 
if for some reason a person cannot have regional anesthesia, either because they have a medical problem like very low platelets or there is an absolute emergency. General anesthesia can be used so that a person is never feeling the pain of a c-section or surgery and that they are protected. Pros of this method are that I'm glad it exists. It may be our last resort but it is very effective and overall known to be safe. Tons of people have surgery under general anesthesia all the time. Though a pregnant woman is at a little bit higher risk of complications from general anesthesia because of the changes of pregnancy that make sometimes obtaining an airway or the risk of throwing up or aspirating a little bit more severe. I love our OB anesthesia colleagues. They are experts in keeping pregnant women safe even when they need general anesthesia. And then the cons of this method are that you're completely asleep so you're not aware during the birth experience. The medications do go in the bloodstream and cross the placenta so we always do want the pediatricians there at the birth to make sure that babies transition well, that anesthesia gets out of their system and that they, if they need any extra support to breathe they have it. Although that's typically like I said very short-lived and we're only using general anesthesia as a last resort anyway. Another con is that the medicines used for general anesthesia do relax the uterus so it can somewhat increase the risk of having a postpartum hemorrhage because the uterus isn't clamping down as it needs to after the birth. Again, general anesthesia. We're super glad it's there when we need it. Typically we're not making a choice to use it. It's kind of our only and our last option but it works very well and we have colleagues who are there to keep you safe. Lastly and importantly is pain control and coping mechanisms that don't use any medicines at all. Before I talk about those, the biggest thing I wanna say as an OB doctor is I am going to support you no matter what you choose. It does not matter to me whether you choose medicines or not. I want you to have the very best experience for you. But often what I see is that people are trying to choose not using pain medicine, not because it's what they want, but because it's what they feel like they should want, because it's what their friend did or that influencer did, or that it might be healthier for their baby that way. And I just wanna make sure you're making the choice for the right reason. Are you making it because it's truly what you want for your birth experience? Or are you making it based on bad information or a feeling like you should because you're a better person? There's no room for morality or good or bad here. So with that being said, let's go into different methods. There's not really one word that I would use to describe the all-encompassing many methods of choosing not to use medication. I really don't like the term natural childbirth all childbirth is natural. In fact, before modern medicine, childbirth was very scary in its natural form. There's lots of methods people use that I like to call mind-body techniques for reducing the pain of labor. For example, there are classes that will teach many different techniques. They'll teach about deep breathing, visualization and meditation, how to use your partner as a support person, birth balls to change positions that are helpful, hot water that feels soothing. So there's those methods. And then there are some methods that are have a specific name like hypnobirthing. And all of these methods are meant to help our mind body connection of refa- reframing what the pain feels like and coping with the pain without using medication. I really like to tell people these things can be helpful even if you do choose pain medication, right? Like in our lives, like we'll feel pain or discomfort and nothing will fully take all of the complete pain of labor away. You'll feel at least pressure and sometimes there are spots with an epidural. So it's never really harmful. The pros of this method is that you are in control. You can move around if that's important to you. There's no technically like side effects of a medication. And like I said, even if you had planned that this was the strategy you're going to use, if you choose another strategy as well, you still use these strategies. The cons are that often it takes extra time and money to have the take the classes, um, whether they're online or in person, and skills to manage pain this way. And often your partner or a birth support person is involved as well. Like I said in the beginning, the biggest thing I tell patients is you don't necessarily know what this will feel like, even if you've had a birth before. So keep an open mind. I want you to know about all the options, but be flexible and be true to the moment. I don't want them setting themselves up thinking it's something to accomplish and that there's some sense of failure. That's just not a We want to make this the best experience that you can have and keeping in mind that, hey, I might change my mind and that's okay is a really great way to approach this. I really hope this helps. If it did, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel so you can be alerted. If you also hit that bell button, you'll be alerted when I put up new videos. We have birth videos every Friday, but sometimes I add vlogs too about my own pregnancy experience. I'm planning to review a bunch of prenatal vitamins, so you want to be alerted for those and comment if you have any questions at all. 
Don't forget to watch last week's episode, which will come up on the screen in a second, all about epidurals. As an OB doctor, I want you to know all pain control options are good. There is no room for a moral obligation or a moral superiority for feeling pain. It's simply a choice for an experience and everyone should make the one that's right for them.